Hi, this is David, and I'm just coming to you. I don't have any script at all, but today I've been thinking about how things are so opposed sometimes, and yet uh, God remains in control. I wrote a little article about that this morning, and uh, I'm still thinking about it. But it works out this way, that the devil does what the devil does, and evil people do what evil people do. And it's not something that, you know, can be really controlled all that much, um, except by God. And somehow God always uses whatever the devil does to accomplish his purpose, and we're working towards an end. I mean, we're coming up on Armageddon, which will be followed by the return of Christ, and then comes a period in which we as saints get to rule and reign with Christ on earth, and that should be an interesting and a wonderful experience. However, until that time, there are some bad things going on. But I was thinking that, you know, whatever the devil has done, I was talking in the article about Joseph. You know, his brothers sold him into slavery, and they certainly didn't mean that for good. They really did not mean that for good. They meant that for evil. They wanted to get rid of this boy, and yet he was God's man. And he was God's choice. And so he went off into slavery and then worked his way up to be uh, second in command in all of Egypt. And then things get rough back home and his brothers go to Egypt looking for food. And who do they run into but good old Joseph. And when they find out who he is, they're all shocked. They're all upset. Uh, they're scared to death that he's just going to kill them. And, you know, he had every right to do that. Um, I'm sure he could have. However, he looked at them and he said, you, you intended that for evil, but God intended it for good. And he was right because God used that to save the people of Israel and to grow a nation. And then he would return them to the promised land. And he did that. And as we go on in history, we see how so many things have happened that way. I mean, nobody can say that anything Adolf Hitler did was good. Nobody can excuse what he was good. Certainly, we can't blame Hitler on God. He was the devil's man, and he did what the devil told him to do. And the devil thought he was going to win. And, well, that's just what the devil thought. But when it was over, all of that horror from the Holocaust, God just took that and focused on it, and he used that to bring about the birth of Israel. Israel is a, a, a great nation. That's God's people, God's country. But we have two sides to everything. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit because it's an interesting subject. You know, Israel had this strange thing where they kept leaving God. And they kept walking away from God. And God kept making promises and he said, hey, if you'll follow me, if you'll do what I tell you to do, you're going to be blessed. But if you mess up and you start following other gods and doing other things, then I'm going to come down hard on you and I'm going to take you away from the nation. I'm going to put you into bondage. I'm going to send you out to other nations. But then after a time, I'm going to bring you back. And that's happened a couple of times. You know, God called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. We like to talk about Cyrus being God's servant, and he certainly was. But God equally called Nebuchadnezzar his servant. And Nebuchadnezzar came before Cyrus, 
And Nebuchadnezzar sent his troops in, and the people of Israel had gone godless, and they had left God, and they'd done all sorts of things. And God said, okay, you need a lesson. And so Nebuchadnezzar came in, he flattened the temple, he, he burned Jerusalem, the great houses, the small houses, he tore everything up, and then he, he left some of the poor people there, but he took the educated people and the people he thought he could use, and he marched them across 500 miles, a little more than 500 miles of desert from Jerusalem into Babylon, and he made them slaves. Was that good? No, that was bad. However, God would use that. And by the time the people got out of Babylon 70 years later, they had renounced and rejected idolatry, and they would never, ever go back to idolatry. They would do other things. They would leave God, but they would never go back into open idolatry after that. They would follow their God, not always the way he wanted to be followed, but they would follow him, and they would claim him as their God. And so it was an interesting thing because 70 years later, along comes Cyrus. God said, I'm going to put you away for 70 years. 70 years exactly later, Cyrus, who's a Persian, not a Babylonian, comes in with his troops under the wall and he conquers Babylon and he kills off all of the royalty and establishes his Persian people as the government. And one of the first things Cyrus does is he gets this idea that he's going to send everybody home. And it wasn't just the Jews, it was the Jews, but he told people who had been brought into Babylon as slaves that they could go back to the nation that they came from. And so the Jews went back, they reestablished, they built a temple, and they put things together again. And then they would go hundreds of years, and they would come up to the time of the Messiah. And when Messiah came, when Jesus, or Yeshua, whoever you want to call him, came along, then they, they turned him down. Why did they turn him down? Why did they reject him? Because for years and years and years, the rabbis had been telling them a story that Messiah was going to ride into Jerusalem on a horse, raise an army, he was going to beat the Romans, and Jerusalem and Israel were going to rule the whole world in exactly the way that the Romans were ruling the world then. They were just going to replace Rome, and in the name of their God, instead of Rome's gods, they were going to run the world. And this is what Messiah was going to do. Now, that's not what Scripture said. Oh, they had a few scriptures, and they pulled a few scriptures out, and they made it sound like that's what the scripture said, but it didn't say that. But when Jesus came along, he fit the scriptural description of the Messiah, but he most certainly did not fit the rabbi's description of the Messiah, and so they rejected Jesus. Jesus was crucified at the will of the Jews, but the Romans actually did the crucifixion. And Jesus died and was raised again and went up into heaven and he came right back down. And then he spent 40 days more or less with uh, the disciples. And then he ascended up into heaven even uh right in front of their eyes and he said you know in the same way or the angel said in the same way uh, that he was taken up he will return and he will but God had said that you know if you act like this I'm going to scatter you and he had said through the prophets and through Isaiah that the people would go off that Israel would cease to exist cease to be a nation, it would go away, and the people would be scattered all over the earth, all over the earth. 
everywhere and that they would be gone. But, he said, and he always promised, there will come a day when I will bring you back to the land. That was God's promise. Don't let anybody tell you God didn't promise that because your Bible is full of it. Tell them to read their own Bible and leave you alone because that's what Scripture says, that God was going to spread them out to the nations and then he would bring them home. And God worked all sorts of miracles for the Jews over the years, and God kept them in their religion, in their culture, spread out all over the world. They maintained their culture, and they knew their language, and they had their scriptures, and even though they had rejected the Messiah, they kept an identity, and they always knew, and they always understand that one day, they always understood that one day God was going to bring them home, and so one day God brought them home. But it's extremely interesting to note that everything works in reverse. Everything works in reverse. The Jubilee comes, and this is the rule of the Jubilee, the law of the Jubilee, that in the 50th year, or in the year God chooses, in a year of Jubilee, everyone is restored, all the Jews are restored to their own land. So if you sold your land because you were hard up for money and you sold it to some guy in the city, what he basically got was a lease that would last until the Jubilee. Now, they didn't actually practice what God told them to do. No, they didn't. But if you follow the law of the Jubilee, which they didn't follow, um, then in the 50th year, the land goes back to the original owner. So the closer you got to the 50th year, the cheaper land got, because if you bought a piece of land in the first year after the Jubilee, you would own it for 49 years, but then you had to give it back. If you came and bought a piece of land 10 years before the Jubilee, then you were only getting a 10-year lease, so you didn't get as much, you didn't, pay as much money for it, but you only kept it 10 years. And then if the person wanted to sell it back to you, they could, but they got the right to go back to their land. And God always calls people back and he gives the land back to the people. This is how it goes. And so along came World War II, Hitler did his thing um, it was an evil, wicked time. We had the Holocaust. And, you know, historians are in pretty good agreement that Hitler was probably the number one person responsible for the existence of Israel as a nation today. Did that make Hitler God's man? Was Hitler doing what God told him to do? No, he was, you know bad guy. But, listen to me, God used that to open the hearts of the world to the idea that the Jews should go back to their country. And so they did, and they got their country, but they didn't get all of it. In 1948, Israel became a nation in a single day. I mean, the prophet had said 700 years before Jesus, is this thing possible? I mean, a nation is formed in a single day, and yet it was. And in the same day, the United Nations voted uh, to allow them to become a nation. Uh, Harry Truman recognized them as a nation, and David Ben-Gurion stood up and made a speech and announced the formation of a nation. Of course, there was an immediate war because all the Arabs attacked them, but they, nobody expected the Jews to win, but they did because it was God's thing. But they specifically didn't get Jerusalem. And so 
50 years later, in 1967, there's a war. They're being attacked, they're being surrounded, but they decide that the best thing to do is to preempt the war. So the night before the war was supposed to start, the night before Egypt was supposed to attack Israel, all of the Egyptians in the Egyptian Air Force were drunk. They were having a party. I mean, they were Muslim. They were probably high, not drunk. But they were having a party. And while they were having a party, the Israeli Air Force came in and bombed all their airplanes. Just smashed them on the ground. The entire Air Force of every surrounding nation got bombed the day before the war was supposed to start. Hmm, interesting. But Israel begged Jordan not to get in the war. Jordan had control over Jerusalem. But Jordan didn't listen. They got involved in the war. If they hadn't gotten involved in the war, Israel would not have gotten Jerusalem. But Israel got Jerusalem. They marched in to Jerusalem. And they marched all the way up to the Wailing Wall and the Temple Mount, and they had control of Jerusalem. But things go backwards. Let me tell you a little story. When Jerusalem was flattened and the temple was burned in 70 AD, a garrison of soldiers ran out and up to a mountain called Masada, and there they established a fortress, and from there they held out, and they did guerrilla warfare against the Romans from there, and they were a pain in Rome's butt. Excuse the language if you don't like that word. But they were really a pain. And so Rome went, and they built up an attack, and they built up a causeway and a way to get into uh, Masada. And the day before they were obviously going to break into Masada and kill everybody, the soldiers decided to kill themselves, and they did. They killed each other, they left one guy who killed himself, and when the Romans entered Masada, they found nothing but dead soldiers. And so the place was empty for 2,000 years almost. It was empty. It was just a place on a hill. And you have to look back, and we have exact dates on these things, and you can look them up. But I'll just tell you that from the day Jerusalem fell till the day the soldiers killed themselves in Masada was 1,333 days. So everything in the Jubilee works backwards. You got that? It works backwards. So back in 1963 somewhere, a garrison of Israeli soldiers went to Masada and began to dig. Basically what they were doing was digging out their own graves. They were digging out the graves where the very last of the Jews had stood against the Romans. And they just began to do that and they did a great excavation work and they found all sorts of things including scripture um, in the, in, hidden in the caves in Masada. And that was interesting. But the most interesting fact is that, do you know how long it was between the day that the soldiers entered Masada to, to excavate it and the day that they stood at the Wailing Wall and cried and said, we have Jerusalem. It, Jerusalem is ours. You know how long that was? Exactly 1,333 days. God was working things backwards. I tell you that from the time that from the day the temple burned 
until the day Masada fell was 1,333 days from the day the Jewish army entered Masada to reclaim it until the day they gained the Temple Mount was 1,333 days. Nobody could plan that, and nobody did plan that. That's God's doing, and you just have to accept it. That's what God did, and nobody can say it's an accident. Nobody can say it's an accident. And Isaiah gives us God speaking, and God says that he will attack He will take Jerusalem and Israel as a lion and as a young lion. He will take it. Do you know there were four colonels in the Israeli army that were exactly the top four guys involved in the taking of the city of Jerusalem. Four of them. Four colonels, four units, four jobs, four places, but The guy that gave the order, the guy that received the order, the guy that made the plan, and the guy that actually led the soldiers through and up the hill, those four guys, three of them had the Hebrew name Lion, and one of them had the Hebrew name Young Lion, Lion, Cub, Lion Cub. So you had three colonels named Lion and one colonel named Young Lion. And God said that when he came to get Jerusalem, he would fight as a lion and as a young lion. Is that just an accident? No. I want you to know that God is in control. God says, you know, when it comes to us and and as saints in these last days, God gives us this thing. And Jesus said, you know, you'll be handed over. Your own children will turn you in. You will be handed over to persecution and death, and they will kill you. The Bible says that it is given to the Antichrist, the anti-Messiah, to make war against the saints and to over come them. Prophecy. Just like Masada fell 1,333 days after Jerusalem, and just like Jerusalem was regained 1,333 days following the beginning of the military excavation of Masada, just as Four colonels were named Lion, 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 and Young Lion. Just as God had said in Isaiah, I will fight on the holy hill and in Zion like a lion and a young lion. In just the same way, God is in charge of all of these things. And you need to understand that you, yeah, you, whatever happens to you, God is in control. Will God kill you and persecute you and hurt you? No, but he will go through it with you. The same guy who died on the cross for you will be with you and in you. No matter what you do, no matter what happens to you, no matter what the devil does to you. Jesus, yeah, the one who died on the cross for you, the one who suffered all that agony, the crown of thorns, the beatings. Yeah, he suffered all that for you. And if you have to suffer, then Jesus is going to be with you and in you, and he's going to help you through it, and he's going to reward you for it when it's over. There is a martyr's crown, you understand. (laughs) You know, There's a special blessing for people who fall into these time periods where they have to suffer for for the God of Israel. And if you have to suffer, you have to suffer. But God will go through it with you. And it will not happen 
one day before God allows it. It won't happen. Will it be God who kills you? No, it'll be bad guys. It'll be really, really bad, evil guys. But listen, they're going to hell and you're going to heaven. You know, if you had to trade places, would you live on like them and go to hell or would you choose to die and go to heaven? I mean, that's basically what we're talking about. And if you live and you overcome and you make it all the way to Armageddon, then, or whenever the rapture happens, before the wrath, I don't know. I have my ideas, but nobody can tell you absolutely, but I can guarantee you it will happen on the day God wants it to happen. And not before, and not after. And so you can just count on that happening. But whatever happens, if you make it till the rapture, you make it till the very end, that's okay too. Because he who overcomes will wear a crown. And so you get a crown. I just want to encourage you that yes, the devil does bad stuff. The devil is doing bad stuff. You know, and in everything you look at, does Donald Trump do good stuff? Yes. Does he do bad stuff? Yes. Has he fulfilled prophecy? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Listen, when he recognized Jerusalem, that was a miracle and a fulfillment of prophecy. When he moved the embassy to Jerusalem, that was a miracle and a fulfillment of prophecy. When he recognized the Golan Heights as belonging to Israel, that was a miracle and a fulfillment of prophecy. His name, his last name is Trump. Trumpet! Trumpet player! Trump! That sound biblical? His first name, Donald, means world ruler. For years they wrote up his articles on him and everyone, including his wife, called him The Donald. They put The in front of his name. That would make it The World Ruler. So, yeah, is he a bad guy? I think so. Is he probably better for your life right now than the opposition? Absolutely. But God's in control, and I just need you to understand that Jesus loves you and no matter what happens in the days to come Jesus is going to care for you and he's going to love you and he's just going to be with you and in you and you just need to turn to God and I'm not talking I have no imagination that unsaved people are watching this except maybe you know, some dude with CIA or something who thinks I'm a bad guy, <laughs> and he's welcome to listen. But, you know, most of you are children of God. You're Christians. You love Jesus. And I'm just going to suggest right now, well, before we go, let me give a quick word of testimony. I was in real trouble one time a long time ago. And I was wanted by the law, and I was hiding. And one day I just couldn't take it anymore, and I laid on my bed and I wept for hours. And my prayer was, oh God, whatever it takes to get me from what I am and where I am to what and where you want me to be, do it. And I, I repeated that probably 50 times in two hours. That was my prayer. You know, the next day I was arrested. I went, I spent six months in prison. Got to know Jesus real well while I was in prison. Six months after I got out of prison, I was on the mission field with Wycliffe in Peru. I went on to work in Mexico and to work for nearly a decade in Venezuela as a missionary. And God's used me and God's using me today and God's using me to talk to you. And what I'm going to encourage you to do 
is to pray, Oh God, whatever it takes, no reservations, none, zero, zip, zip, nada, no reservations. Oh God, I just ask you in Jesus' name, whatever it takes to get me from what I am and where I am to what and where you want me to be, do it. Let me tell you something. I am so glad I prayed that prayer. And I am so glad that even though the first days after I, I, I prayed that prayer were really rough, God has used it and God has answered that prayer. And today, today I sat in my chair listening to Christian music and I prayed, Oh God, whatever it takes to get me from what I am and where I am right now to what and where you want me to be, do it. Listen, would you pray for me that way? Would you ask God to do that? Just ask God to do that. Say, God, would you take David? I just ask you in Jesus' name, would you take David from what he is and where he is today to what and where you want him to be? If you'd pray that for me, I'd just be so appreciative. And I'll return the favor. God bless you. Have a great day.